I can attest to the fact that Pastor Luke very rarely uses shampoo. Uh, I lived with him in college, and when I ran out of shampoo, I just used his instead of went to buy more because his bottle was full, okay? Man, I love being here with you guys. Happy Mother's Day uh, once again. You're going to hear that all, all day today. Uh, and I want to say specifically happy, happy Mother's Day uh, to those of you who are mothers of children that you never expected to be mothers of. Uh, for example, I have... I tell people I have a lot of moms, and it's because um, in my neighborhood where I grew up, all of my friends' moms became my mom, uh, and I forced them to take responsibility for me, you know? And some of you have been forced to take responsibility for kids that you'd never intended to take responsibility for, and I just want to say thank you for that, okay? Uh, And I also uh, told my mom, I wouldn't uh, tell embarrassing stories about her on Mother's Day uh, because that wouldn't be fun. But then I was like, maybe I should, but I'm not going to do it because I'm still scared of my mom. (laughs) And my wife is watching online right now. Happy Mother's Day, Carissa. This is your first Mother's Day with a baby outside of the womb. uh, And I love you. Happy Mother's Day. Yes. There is a Mother's Day rose sale going on right outside these doors. It's a great gift for mothers. There's uh, individual roses, also a bouquet of roses for sale right outside here that you can hit up uh, on your way out. If you haven't gotten your mom a gift yet, uh, Blake, I'm looking at you on the camera, buddy. Okay, this is perfect opportunity for you. Um, Last thing I need to say is today is Pastor Brett's last Sunday with us as a staff member um, of this church. And Pastor Brett holds a a special place in my heart because there's two people um, who, when I was a teenager, encouraged me. Most of you don't know this. I used to lead worship. Uh, There's a reason why I don't anymore. Uh, But I used to lead worship. And uh, two people, two people encouraged me to do that. Pastor Brian uh, forced me to do it when I was his student because, you know, he was my youth pastor and he forced me to do a lot of things, um, include follow Jesus. So, right, there's a positive in that. Uh, but the second one was Pastor Brett. Pastor Brett heard me sing one time and he came up to me and he probably doesn't remember this conversation, but he encouraged me. He said, God has given you a gift and I encourage you no matter where you go to use it to bring glory to God. And I've remembered that conversation since I was a, a sophomore in high school. So I just want to say thank you to Pastor Brett. I love you and we'll all miss you. And there is a spot at the event center, uh, a basket for cards. If you have a card or something or a gift that you want to give to uh, the Hendricksons as, as Uh, they exit being a staff member. Um, We still love them. They're still a part of our family, so we can bless them in that way. All right? You with me this morning? Come on. Hey, I'm excited that we're continuing our series better, uh, talking about the Holy Spirit. And here's our theme verse, John 16, 7. It says this, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus talking to the believers. I tell you the truth. It is better for you that I go away. If I do not go, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The promise of the Father, the helper, the advocate, the counselor, the Holy Spirit. Jesus is telling his believers, it is better for you that I go away because the truth is that the Holy Spirit inside of us is better than Jesus beside of us, right? The Holy Spirit and God's presence inside of us is better than Jesus beside us. Why? Because if Jesus were still on this planet, we would have to uh, buy plane tickets every time we needed to hear from the Lord and we would need to fly to the Middle East and then get on a camel and roll around the desert until we found this dude named Jesus so we could ask him questions and say what, you know, all the things that we pray and ask about. We would have to get on a plane to go find him. But he said, no, that's not how we're gonna operate. I'm gonna release my presence. I'm gonna release my spirit. I'm gonna release uh, the promise of the Father onto all believers for all time so it is better for you if I go it is better for you uh, for the Holy Spirit to be with you and to live inside of your heart and so I would say this to us church it is better for us to live life with the Spirit than it is to live life without him and that's a promise from Scripture it is better for us to daily operate in the Holy Spirit to daily interact with the Spirit of God to daily dwell in the presence of God than it is for us to live without and why because the presence of God leads to life and the uh, the absence of the presence of God leads to death so you want life this morning then it's better for you to have the Spirit 
better for us. We carry God's presence with us everywhere we go. We don't have to board a plane. Like I said, we don't have to try to find him and, and feel like he's this elusive presence. No, the, the Bible tells us that when you seek me, I am there. Uh, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so if we want to experience true, genuine freedom, we need the spirit of God. And sometimes I, I, I read that verse and I'm like, but why is it better, Jesus? Why is it better for us to have the Holy Spirit? Obviously, we have your presence and stuff, but why is it better? And, and, and I, I like the way the Bible says it. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, Jesus is telling the disciples, telling the believers, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I'm one of those little kids that always asked why. Why? Why this? Why that? Why? And I do the same thing, and I would drive my dad crazy. Why is the stove hot? You tell me not to touch it because it's hot. Why is it hot? What makes it hot? Why can't I touch it? Can I touch it now? Is it cold enough for me to touch it now? What if I turn this dial, right? I'm the kid that always asks a lot of questions. And so as I'm learning this, right, as I'm learning about the Holy Spirit growing up and now even studying for this message, I ask, why is it better? You will receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. What kind of power? What kind of power? And then I found Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says this, The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. What kind of power do we get when we have the Holy Spirit? We get the kind of power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We get the kind of power that breathes life into mortal bones. We get life-giving power of God. We we get the kind of power that opens blind eyes. We get the kind of power that brings lame uh, back to, to life and allows them to walk. We get the kind of power that gives us boldness to be the witnesses that we have been created to be. Do you need that kind of power this morning? The kind of power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is the power that lives inside of us, is the spirit that lives inside of us. The, the kind of power that gives common everyday people the boldness to love and reach lost people. It's that kind of power. And this morning we're gonna talk about boldness. Everybody say boldness. Come on, boldness. The Holy Spirit in us gives us supernatural boldness to reach out to people who are separated from Jesus. And so today I'm preaching a message called Better Boldness. The Holy Spirit gives us the boldness to do what he's asked us to do. The Holy Spirit gives us the boldness to say what he's asked us to say. And the Holy Spirit gives us the boldness to be who we've been created to be. One great example of boldness comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 41. It's, that's a long stretch of verses. I'm not going to read all of it, but last week we covered the upper room moment, right, where the Holy Spirit was finally, Jesus gave the gift after they had been waiting in the, in the upper room. And on the day of Pentecost, Jesus sends the gift of the Holy Spirit to the believers, and he's dispersed throughout all the believers, right, tongues of fire, things like that, windstorm, all this stuff, right? We covered that last week. And so this week is the next section of Acts 2, starting in verse 14. And this is a, a, an amazing example of boldness from Peter. It says this, Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles, and he shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming, because nine o'clock in the morning is way too early for that. Remember the, the people had gathered when they heard the, the tongues, when they heard people speaking in, in their own native languages when they shouldn't have been. And so they gathered and they're like, what's happening? What's going on? Are these people drunk? Peter said, no, 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 no. They're not drunk. Verse 16, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But verse 21 but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Hallelujah that we have the opportunity to be saved. Hallelujah. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter stands up in boldness and he begins to share the gospel. He begins to share the good news. He begins to tell people about Jesus with the crowd of people who's assembled together. They've assembled to see what's happening and Peter is sharing the gospel. He's sharing the good news. He's preaching a sermon. And here's a question that I have this morning. When's the last time, when's the last time that a mighty move of God among the believers, a mighty move of God among the believers was so great that crowds of non-believers gathered to see what was happening? When's the last time we lived so surrendered to God that when he moved mightily in us, it drew a crowd so that we could share the good news, so that we could share the gospel. Church, we pray for revival. We ask for a move of the Spirit. But here's the question. Are we asking for revival in us, or are we asking for a move in the Spirit in the world around us? Guess what we're not supposed to be? Containers of the gospel containers of the spirit where we just contain it no we're meant to be givers of the light of jesus christ givers of the spirit of god givers of the presence givers of the uh, of the signs and wonders givers of god to people all people around us when's the last time our boldness drew a crowd so that we could share the gospel when's the last time that the spirit inside of us drew a crowd of non-believers so that we could share what Jesus has done in our hearts and in our lives. I was challenged by this. I was challenged by this because I think far too often we get comfortable in our gatherings of like-minded people which are completely necessary. We have to have our church gatherings. We have to have our church family. That's how we operate. That's how we are sustained in this life. That's how we are sustained in following Jesus. We have to have our church family, but church, we cannot neglect non-believers because we get so comfortable with our own church family. If our mission statement is actually to go to heaven and take as many people as possible, guess who's not going to heaven? Non-believers. And guess who needs to know about the hope and love that we found in Jesus Christ? Non-believers. And so just as Peter was given the boldness of the Holy Spirit to stand up and preach the gospel, church, we too need the boldness of the Holy Spirit to walk through doors of opportunity to reach our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, our family members who are far from Jesus. Are you with me this morning? A move of God is always attractive. A move of God should always draw non-believers in. A move of God should never push people away. We need to be, we need to be a people who foster a move of God that brings non-believers into the family. We need to be a church that fosters the spirit of God, that we are so attractive to non-believers that when they see us and when they hear us speak, they say, man, there is something about you that I need to know about. And then we need to be sharers of the good news. You with me this morning? Come on. The supernatural boldness from God moved in Peter so much that day that 3,000 people joined the family of God. And here's the good part. From that moment forward, he never stopped operating in the boldness. From that moment forward, he never stopped operating in the boldness. In Acts chapter 3, in boldness, Peter stepped out of his routine. And we get the story of Peter, Peter and John going to the temple like they did every day of their lives. Like they did normal. This was their normal routine to go to the temple. But on this day, because they had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, because they saw people differently than they had before. They saw a man sitting at the gate called Beautiful, who was lame since birth and who had been carried to that gate every day for his life and on this day because they were filled with power because they were filled with boldness Peter saw a man and we get a beautiful story where he says silver and gold have I not to give to you but what I do have I give to you freely and he reached out his hand and said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth get up and walk and he helped the man up and in, a, in that moment in his boldness and in the power under the power of the Holy Spirit a lame man got up and walked Amazing, it was amazing. 
And then Peter and John, because they, under the power of the Holy Spirit and through the name of Jesus Christ, caused a ruckus, are called before the council. And this is where I want to pick up the story, Acts chapter, uh, chapter 4, starting in verse 5. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we have done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was, how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other, uh, other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And the members of the council were amazed when they saw the what? Come on, when they saw the what? When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Let me stop there. They were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Pastor Luke and I studied together uh, for this sermon, and he found that the original text there, the word for the original text is better translated. They were idiots. <laughs> and then he said, I bet you won't say idiot from the platform. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Pastor Weaver's on vacation. Come on, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Love you, Pastor Weaver. They were ordinary men. Better translated, they were not smart. They were not trained. They were not the ones with the high GPA. Come on. I read this verse and I get very excited about what God has called me to do because that man explains me perfectly, especially if you ask my dad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Ordinary men with no special training, and they were impressed by their boldness. But since they could see the men who had see the man who had been healed, verse 14. Oh, wait, I need to go back to 13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. I'm gonna pause there one more time. Do people recognize you as a person who has been with Jesus? Do people recognize you as a person who has been with Jesus? But since they could see the man who had been healed, verse 14, standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men, they asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. Verse 18, so they called the apostles back in, commanded them, never again speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Pause right there again. The government, the rulers, the elders of their people, commanding them, never again speak or preach or teach or talk to anyone in the name of Jesus. Never again. Verse 19, but Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We will not, cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Ooh, I just got the goosebumps. Talk about some boldness. Talk about some courage. Talk about some Holy Spirit power. Come on, I don't know about you, but I need that boldness. I want that boldness. But it's easy for us to say, but Pastor August, that's Peter, man. Peter's like high class. Peter's the one that said, when Jesus asked, who do the people say I am? He said, they think you're Elijah or Elisha or one of the prophets. But he said, who do you think I am? And it was Peter, Pastor August. It was Peter who stood up and said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Come on, Pastor August, we're talking about Peter. You expect me? Peter's the one who walked on the water. You expect me to be like Peter? 
Let's remember who Peter actually is. Because boldness hasn't always been Peter's testimony. Luke chapter 22. So they arrested him, verse, starting in verse 54. They arrested him, him being Jesus, and led him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And at that moment, the Lord Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard, weeping bitterly. This is some 50 days. 50 days before this moment in Acts chapter 2, when Peter is filled with the spirit and with boldness, he couldn't even admit that he knew who Jesus was to a teenager. He couldn't even admit to a teenager that he had been with Jesus. Peter hasn't always been bold. That's not been Peter's testimony. He hasn't always been bold. Another, uh, another story somewhere in the Gospels, I don't remember exactly where it is, says that, that he, he even used curse words to emphasize, I don't know who Jesus is. This Peter that we read about in Acts after this upper room moment is a very different person. Why? Because this Peter has been saved by and reconciled back to Jesus. And this Peter has been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And this Peter can now stand up in the same city that he was once a coward in, in front of most likely the same people he denied Jesus, and with boldness proclaim that Jesus whom they crucified is the Son of the living God, and he gave his life so that you too can experience salvation if you would only believe in him. This Peter can now stand in front of massive crowds, in front of all opposition and persecution the same people that he was afraid of in Luke 22 and he can reach out to them in Acts chapter 2 come on somebody this is the same Peter this is the same Peter what's the difference the difference in he's been saved and sanctified by Jesus Christ and filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit so church let me ask you again how amazed are people by your boldness how amazed are people by your boldness? The truth is we all need boldness. I need Holy Spirit boldness. It's easy for us to get caught up in our own personality traits and insecurities and, and our fear of rejection. I, I'm an introvert, Pastor August. There's no way I could speak out about Jesus. What if they don't accept me? What if they laugh at me? What if they reject me? What if I'm outcasted? What about my reputation? But what if this is the moment that Jesus needs to do a miracle in somebody's life around you and he needs you to step out in faith and boldness to do it? Isn't that more worth it? I tell this to our students, we, we tell this to our students all the time. You are plan A for your school. And church, let me tell you something. You are plan A for your workplace. You are plan A for your neighborhood. You are plan A for your family. There is no plan B. You're it. If you carry the spirit of God inside of your hearts, if you are a believer in Jesus, if you have given your life to him and if you follow him filled with the Holy Spirit, then you are plan A. It's time for us to step up and say, God, I'm here, I'm willing, and I'm ready to go. Fill me with boldness like you did, Peter. Fill me with boldness like you did, your disciples. Biblical Holy Spirit boldness is not a personality trait. It's a supernatural ability given to us by God himself. It's the power to be obedient to do what he's called us to do and to say what he's telling us to say. Also, also, recognize this 
Holy Spirit boldness isn't reserved for just the preachers, right? It's easy to say, yeah, Pastor August, of course, of course, you, you need boldness. This, this sermon you're preaching is great, but it's better suited for a room full of preachers. No. Holy Spirit boldness, this is for all who believe in Jesus. All who believe in Jesus. You know how I know? Because Jesus told the believers in Matthew 28, the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go into all the world and tell the story. Go into all the world and teach these new disciples. Make disciples and teach them to follow my commands. And then he said, we just read it in Romans chapter eight, uh, verse 11 through, through Paul. He said, for all of you, this is for all of the believers. I'm writing this book, this letter, to all believers that the same spirit spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit that lives inside of you. And then in Acts chapter 6 and 7, there's a story about one of the greatest people, in my opinion, in my preference. I love the story of Stephen the martyr. In Acts chapter 6 and 7, I don't have time to read it to you. That's homework. Go read it yourselves. Or maybe today, because it's Mother's Day, read a Bible story to your mom. It will bless her heart. The reason why I love the story of Stephen the martyr is because I'm a whole lot like Stephen the martyr. Stephen was just a common, everyday dude. Matter of fact, in today's terms, he was a waiter. He was a server at a restaurant. And I love it because I used to serve at a restaurant. I used to work at a Chinese restaurant. And it was awesome. People were very thrown off when I would bring them their food. Like, wait a minute. I used to wait tables. I used to serve food. And the Bible tells us in Acts 6 and 7 about Stephen who would serve food, filled with the Holy Spirit, praying, and miracles would happen, and speaking in boldness before the council. And then when they put him to death, in boldness as he was dying, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't understand what they're doing. It's boldness that we need because there is no obedience to God without his boldness in our lives. We need his boldness to operate in his gifts. We need his boldness to live the life that he's created us to live. We need the boldness of the Holy Spirit this morning. Boldness gives us the opportunity to step out in faith. Boldness and obedience go hand in hand. God fills me with boldness and so I step out in faith. And so I step out in, in obedience. I have to have faith to have boldness. I have to have faith to be bold. And so because I have faith in Jesus, he fills me with this Holy Spirit spirit and he gives me the boldness to step out in that faith which builds my faith to be greater and so I'm filled with the spirit more and he sends me out in boldness again we have to have faith to be bold but here's a hard truth here's a hard truth Holy Spirit boldness does not remove opposition it would be so much easier if we were never faced with opposition. This life would be so much easier if everyone just agreed with us the moment we shared about Jesus. But, praise be to God, he didn't call us to an easy life. He called us to a bold life. Boldness doesn't remove opposition. It doesn't remove discomfort or nervousness, nervousness, excuse me, or even the fear of stepping out. No, his boldness gives us the ability to be obedient in the middle of all of that. And in Acts 4, 23 through 31, it says that Peter and John, after they were in jail, after they testified before the council, and after the council threatened their lives and said, don't speak about Jesus any longer, it says that they went back to the other believers. They told them everything that, they happened and th that had happened, and then they started praying. And in their prayer, they said this in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. And now, O Lord, hear their threats. And give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook, 
They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they preached the word of God with great boldness. Go back to that slide for me, Brenda. Hear their threats. Give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. You know what that doesn't sound like? That doesn't sound like, God, this person at work is opposing me, and I need you to remove them. Uh Uh-oh. We've prayed those prayers before. Come on. God, I've been preaching and I've been telling them and I've been telling them about you. I've been, trying to, I've been trying to be faithful, but God, they just keep coming at me. They just keep pressing my buttons. They just keep annoying me. They just keep frustrating me and I can't handle it anymore. God, you need to take the opposition away. That's not what that sounds like, but that's all prayers we've prayed. Maybe, maybe it looks more like this. Maybe it looks more like this. God, the teachers at the school are in opposition to your word, and I need you to remove them from their position. Got very quiet, Pastor Jeff. Or maybe it looks like this. God, there's people in leadership in the government who's in opposition to your word, and you need to remove them. And now, O Lord, hear their threats, but give us boldness. Maybe, just maybe, we should stop spending our time and our energy and our effort in prayer asking God to remove opposition. And instead, we should be asking that he change our hearts and say, God, give us the boldness. Give us the boldness to reach out. Give us the boldness and opportunity to preach your word, to preach your gospel, and to see lives and hearts changed. God, don't remove the opposition. Send me to them. Come on, church. Come on. We weren't meant to live easy lives. We weren't meant to live lives without trials and struggles. Matter of fact, Jesus himself says, I've been through this world and I know you will experience great trials, great tribulations, and great suffering. But take heart, I have overcome the world and so will you. That doesn't mean that he's going to remove opposition. That doesn't mean that he's going to remove trials. No, that means that he's given us the power of his Holy Spirit to walk through them all. He's given us the boldness to walk through it. He's given us the ability and the opportunity to take, to reach lost people, even those who are in opposition to us. Who are we to ask God to remove opposition when the great four fathers of our faith prayed, give us boldness? What would happen in your workplace? What would happen in your family? What would happen in your neighborhood if your prayer changed from God, take away the opposition to God, give me the boldness and the opportunity to make a difference? Give me the boldness. I believe in you. I am filled with your spirit. So give me the boldness to step out in faith and make a difference. When was the last time you prayed for the boldness to speak more, to do more, and to be more? So I'm going to close with this this morning. Do you need more boldness? Come on. Do you need more boldness? I do. Do you need more of the Holy Spirit? In the New Testament, boldness is literally translated as the freedom to say everything. What would happen if our prayer was, God, please give me the opportunity and the freedom to say everything that needs to be said in love and help me reach, insert name here, so that they too can know you? How would that change your workplace, your family, and your neighborhood? Understand that most of the time the Holy Spirit gives boldness in the New Testament. It was for them to speak because the command from Jesus was you will be filled with power so that you can be my witness. And what is a witness but a person who tells a story? 
when God gives us, when the Holy Spirit gives us boldness, it was for us first to speak, for the boldness to share, to tell people about Jesus, to share the gospel. And it's found, the noun is found in the New Testament 31 times, and the verb form is found nine times, and it's almost always found in the context of speaking. And our culture today has made it nearly impossible to speak with boldness. The culture we live in today has made it nearly impossible to speak with boldness and it's because the enemy is trying to disarm the people of God. The enemy is trying to disarm the people of God. We become, excuse me, we live in a time where everything coming from God's word is considered hate speech. We live in cancel culture who's quick to strike anyone who doesn't agree with them. And we've even become embarrassed by ourselves because for years, street corner preachers overdid it with their constant messages of condemnation. And so I believe that the church, because of our embarrassment, we've adopted the culture of St. Francis of Assisi who said, preach the gospel at all times, but if necessary, use words. And it's a great sentiment, I get it, yes. Your actions need to be an example of Jesus. We need to show the world that we're not hypocrites, that we live out what we believe in our actions, but I don't know about you, my actions are not enough. I am not perfect and I always make mistakes and I need to do what Jesus told me to do, to go into all the world, to tell the story, to teach people his ways, to teach people about him and to make disciples. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it like this in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about them? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That's why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed your message? So faith comes from hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. Far too often and recently we've said, people will just recognize that I'm different by the way I live my life. And then they'll come and they'll ask me, why are you different? But we can't just expect people to see that we're different and guess, why is it that you're different? We gotta tell them the truth. Our lifestyle of following Jesus is necessary, but so are the words that come out of our mouths. We have to be bold preachers of the word, telling people the good news of salvation that is only found in Jesus Christ. Please don't hear what I am not saying. I am not telling you to go to work tomorrow and in staff meeting, get up on the table and begin shouting and preaching and telling people that they're gonna go to hell if they don't follow Jesus. I'm not telling you to go stand on the street corner and tell everyone who walks by that they're going to hell if they don't follow Jesus. What I am saying is this, do not shy away from the gospel. Do not shy away from the truth, but seek the boldness of the Holy Spirit and the opportunities to share the gospel and maybe ask to start with the people that you already have a relationship with. Hey, how was your weekend? Man, listen. My weekend was wild. First of all, I went to start my truck and my truck wouldn't start. So then I went to get my other truck, you know, because I've got two trucks and my other truck, uh, the tires were flat. And so then I was like, man, I need to figure out what's going on with my trucks. And so then I, got, I asked my wife, hey, can you take me down to the auto parts store? And as we were on the way to the auto parts store, somebody rear-ended us. And so now we're stuck on the road dealing with somebody who rear-ended us. And this is pretty much our entire Saturday. And then I got, we finally got to the auto parts store, figured out what we needed to get. We got back to the house and I went to mow the lawn and then there was no gas in the lawnmower and I didn't realize. And so I started pulling the string and pulling and pulling and pulling. And then the pull string busted. And now here we go, my life sounds Sounds like a country song. You know what a great response to that is? Is man, I'm so sorry your weekend was like that. But let me tell you something. I believe in Jesus. And I believe that He has changed my life. And I believe that He has the power to help and heal anything. You mind if we pray for your truck right now? I'm pretty sure Pastor Austin told a story about how he needed a new truck engine and he prayed for it and didn't need a new truck engine anymore, right? 
Or what about this? Hey, how was your weekend? My weekend wasn't great. I had to take my wife to the hospital because she got injured. And so now she's laid up in the hospital. Man, I'm so sorry. But can I tell you something? I believe in a man named Jesus who changed my life and I believe that he will help and heal anything and any person. Can we pray about her right now? You know what that doesn't sound like? Condemnation. You know what that sounds like? Hope. We need to be hope dealers this morning. Here's the amazing thing about speaking the gospel. Signs and wonders and miracles follow the word. After Jesus goes up into heaven in Mark chapter 16, verse 20, it says the disciples went everywhere and preached and the Lord worked, worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Hebrews 2, 4, and God confirmed the message by giving, God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders of various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. Romans 15, 18 through 19, yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked among them. They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's spirit. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. Signs and wonders are confirmation of what, be, of what is being said. How often do we pray for signs and wonders, but we keep our mouth shut when it's time to preach the gospel? Mike Franson, an evangelist and author, said this, God's word is not void of power. His people are void of speech. Thus the word is powerless only when it is unspoken. Would you stand with me this morning? We so badly want to see signs and wonders. We so badly want to use the supernatural gifts of the spirit, but they often and almost always follow our obedience to preaching the word. So my point is this, do you need to see, do you want to see the Holy Spirit do supernatural things and work in your life? Then it's time to respond in obedience and speak up and preach the gospel. If you want to see more, you need to speak more. And so this morning, I'm going to ask you this. If you want the boldness of the Holy Spirit, if there are people who are far from Jesus in your sphere of influence, if you want the power of the Holy Spirit, then I'm asking you to take a step in boldness this morning. In just a moment, I'm going to challenge you in boldness to step out of your seat, to come down to this altar and say, God, I need more of you. If you're here today and you would say, I've never given my life to Jesus and I, I want this, I want to give my life to Jesus, then I'm gonna ask you to respond in boldness with everybody else who comes. And in boldness, come down to this altar and say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I, I, need this. I can't continue living the way that I'm living. I repent, I, I need your forgiveness and I need you. Finally, because we believe in a God who is alive and in a God who works. If you would say, there's something that I need God to do in my life. I have a need, a physical healing, an emotional need, a family member has a need, something. If that's you this morning, you say, I have a need, then I want you to respond in boldness and come to this altar and say, God, I need more of you. God, I need you to work in this situation, in this moment where no one else can work, only you can. God, we need your spirit to move. So eyes open, heads up. If you're here this morning and one of those three things applies to you, you want Jesus for the first time or the first time in a long time, you need to ask for more boldness from the Holy Spirit. You want more of the Holy Spirit or you have a need that you need to be prayed for. What I'm asking is that all of you would respond. And if you have specifically a need and you would like to be prayed over by a pastor, come right here in this area. Me, Pastor Jeff, other prayer leaders will meet you right here. But if any of those three things apply to you, one, two, three, this is your moment in boldness, move to the altar. Come on. Move, this is your time, this is your moment. If you would say, I need more boldness from the Holy Spirit, I have a need that needs to be prayed for and I want somebody to pray with me, or you would say, I need Jesus for the very first time. We're gonna sing this song and then we're gonna be done, but let's believe and receive the boldness from the Holy Spirit this morning. Would you?